I don't think they saw my presentation and I didn't see theirs, but many of the things that, you know, I'm going to talk about that, that I, I, you know, that I, I pause and wonder when you're asked to, you know, do a presentation like this early in the day, right? What might be interesting? What might be useful? And many of the things that the panel talked about, I actually think I'm going to hit. That was very well teed up for me. So, you know, what am I going to talk about? This, um, this idea of as how we as an industry can uh, take this idea of, of, of the hype cycle, 50 billion devices. I'm kind of with these guys, sort of. You know, so what? Who cares, as my kids would say? Uh, you know, who cares how big it is? It is big. The thing, the place we're at today is much more about how do we take these early successes, the use cases, the industry, where there's traction, where the technology fits a, a, a business case, and how do we go from innovation to commercialization? And so that's a little bit what I want to touch on. We as a company, as Carl said, we really honestly started in the industrial electronic space about 20 years ago. Uh, and what naturally happens there, you have intelligence in in everything from tractors to washing machines to coffee machines. And uh, through this, the innovation that's occurring, people start asking, you know, hey, I think there's some data in there that I like or that I would like to do. And, you know, I've heard that this can be useful and I can be more competitive and make more money. So that's what I want to talk about is, is and it's a subject that uh, I think is extremely important. I wake up every day and I think about it. And I think about it because our customers ask us about it. They ask us, how can we go faster? Do we have a system design that is going to take me without, without squashing innovation in the early parts of, of ideation, but how do, I, how do I still do that quickly, but yet when I go onto a path where I make a commitment, how do I do that and get to production so that whether it's a hockey stick or a 30% growth, uh, you know, sort of who cares. So uh, there's another force or a, or a set of forces, I think, that are at play in this market. And we, and we heard a little bit about it uh, with the first panel is, you know, we're all very familiar with Moore's Law of computing, of course. We've got some great Intel folks here uh, that, could, that could share a lot more details. But this idea that computing capability doubles every 18 to 24 months. So that's another thing that maybe uh, in the last five, eight years, you know, some of us in the software industry... Uh, maybe stop thinking about a little bit. Cloud computing, virtualization, ah, so what? How, how, who cares how fast some of the electronics and silicon is? Uh, but it's back in vogue now, and it's back in vogue because of the intelligence that, that is at the edge. So, um, and it actually uh, gives us different uh, opportunities and options when we think about how we architect the edge. So the, the other thing is, of course, we all understand crossing the chasm and really the early to, uh, to the... To the to really the majority adoption cycle. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that is changing for technology adoption. But there's a new idea. Uh, some very smart consultants published some stuff in uh, the Harvard Business Review just a few years ago about the, the big bang adoption model. And we see it. We see it with things like Amazon, how it disrupted the, the book industry. We see it in what... Uh, uh, in what's happening in the taxi industry. We see these things by putting a service platform and you know, you know, now we, we change a whole industry. So this set of forces that's at play is forcing us to actually get, get more things right early, I think. So some of this is my opinion, but, but there's enough examples of this sort of big bang adoption that's occurring that, uh, that, that, that our investors, our customers, our partners, kind of are starting to expect it. So some of the forces uh, in play that are really pushing that curve forward. So you, you, you really almost don't cross a chasm sometimes. You go from innovation to rapid production. This is a good problem to have, of course, but uh, people do ask us, how do we plan for that? Uh, so agile development. Uh, I think we finally got it right as an industry that was misunderstood for a long time, and it uh, it was really, there were some poor expectations about it. Agile just meant if I'm in marketing, I could, you know, go to the software engineering team and get a change tomorrow, right? That didn't really work that way. Security is, is, a, is a subject that uh, will always be a force. It will never go away. It's a very, very serious subject. Uh, and it's not just about any one part of the, of the stack of technology. Uh, the role of open source. So this is one that, I, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about about 
about the forces and the opportunity where, where standardization and innovation is coming from so that we can not necessarily have a not invented here kind of a mindset. But open source uh, in the modern technology world is a big factor for sure. Standardization is one of the biggest things that uh, is holding us back a little bit as an industry, but it is a force that says if you get it right and if you can you know, navigate through you know, where standardization needs to exist, how you do good abstraction, uh, you know, it'll have an impact on how you bring your adoption curve over. Uh, I talked a little bit about silicon, the chipsets. So Moore's Law says you know, that we can do so much uh, in the silicon now that, that really we don't even talk about the microcontroller or the microprocessor as a discrete thing anymore. We talk about the system on a chip. So we've been building rugged, industrial, long-life boards for a long time with uh, connectivity software and embedded OSs. Uh, and this, um, you know, the capabilities of these systems now uh, allows us to do some things that just two years ago we would have never thought about. For example, you know, running Java in an embedded space, which I'll talk about. Uh, the, the impact of wireless, of course. And perhaps the biggest thing, uh, sort of the biggest thing, we're, you know, we're all having fun uh, innovating and dreaming about what's possible. Uh, but the backdrop, of course, is... Uh, is return on investment and, and use cases that actually uh, produce value to somebody. So these forces, the expectations that come with them, some of them external, some of them uh, really created by uh, the enabling, you know, sort of shifts in the market, uh, force us, uh, you know, to recognize what kind of a slope we can take. And, we, and I think we owe it. I believe this room, you know, when we look at who's here, it's, there's a lot of uh, software vendors, a lot of network companies, a lot of hardware companies, many enterprises, I'm sure, some municipalities uh, and government uh, reps, I'm sure, also. Uh, but, you know, when we get this right, we owe it to ourselves and to this industry. From, in my point of view, what, what we talked about earlier is, independent of the number, regardless of the number, let's get up the curve to commercialization uh, faster, okay? So... Uh, Aren't IoT projects just another IT project? And that's something that, that people actually ask me, and when we engage with our customers, uh, we sort of see this, and we've actually learned to recognize uh, the point of view of a, of a customer or an integrator or a partner uh, in maybe heading down a sort of a traditional IT development path or methodology or, or even philosophy. So within uh, with, you know, normal IT projects, uh, centralized support, IP to the core, you know, you know your infrastructure, you know your cloud provider, you know your development tools. Uh, we now have uh, really pretty good standards uh, and, uh, and, and design options really for, for integration. You know, I do compare it a little bit like the panel did to, uh, to, the, to the rollout of mobile applications. So we went from you know, everybody building mobile apps sort of in uh, all kinds of different tools to, you know, now and how you did that integration to now RESTful interfaces and, you know, service-oriented service architectures, that's easy. There's some things that are shared, of course, uh, some complexity, the, sh the serious impact on uh, budget and corporate strategy, uh, and the fact that, that many IT solutions are very complicated, of course, right? Big CRM systems, big e-commerce systems, things we run our business on. Okay, but here's the thing that matters that, that I want to talk about here for the last few minutes is what's different about IoT when you think about not just building it, but when you think about designing it to, to get through an innovation cycle, get through a prototype cycle, and actually get to, uh, get to production and growth and scale. So this idea of, it's very distributed, we, you know, we all know that. 50 billion endpoints, it's not really, it is in a sense maybe it's 50 billion, but we know that, that they're not all going to be discrete endpoints. Many of them are going to be aggregated through gateways, right? Whether it's in some stationary uh, gateway on a rooftop managing energy consumption, you know, around uh, a bunch of uh, commercial properties, uh, or even on vehicles communicating front of train, back of train, communicating with each other. So, so they're not all discrete. Last mile protocol diversity. I know some of uh, the other folks we work with uh, that we get sensors, uh, that we partner with for sensors. One of the biggest things is, are the standards that are different between industries uh, like energy and like home automation and like building controls. So this idea of, of uh, 
you know, I just go get it and plug and play and snap something together and, you know, the, the, the sensor auto connects. That's not so true, right? You know, that's changing quickly, but, but not fast enough. And by the way, the innovation in the sensor space is one of the coolest, most remarkable things uh, happening, I think. Uh, we see this shift in, in difference between who leads a project. Traditional IT projects, it's, you know, they're not just IT-led, but, but really these become big budget cycles around IT uh, in both timing and funding. In IoT, the thing that, that we see every day is it is like the mobile apps. It's like the marketing manager that needed the mobile app for their company, you know, five years ago and couldn't get it in the IT uh, development cycle. We're seeing the same thing now in IT. Line of business leaders uh, you know, want to do something. They want to, they want to test something. They want to see if they automate uh, some data collection, uh, you know, if it will change the way that they can use their tools and their decision support. Um, by the way, we were talking about data earlier. There's a number that I think is, is phenomenal and staggering. I meant to mention it earlier. Is I, I don't recall the source exactly, but I believe it. Uh, said that between the dawn of... Uh, of, of modern man to 2003, we generated five exabytes of data. The number now is we generate five exabytes of data every two days, right? That's pretty staggering. We talk about are we generating the right data? Uh, I'm not so sure. But the big thing about, the biggest thing I think about uh, what's different about IoT projects is, is the intelligence at the edge. You know, we've heard it mentioned already. We'll talk about it a lot more. Uh, many of the breakouts and the panels address this. But it is, it is not just the development that's happening in a server, that's happening in your cloud somewhere, that's an add-on uh, module to some existing software. This is new software that you've never written before, that you've never designed, that you've never supported, uh, and that you've never thought about it, to, you know, typically, you know, managing the life cycle of this kind of software. So this... You know, this is the biggest complexity. And, in, you know, as a... Uh, so as we think about this bridge, bridging from pilot to production, uh, there's lots of considerations. Um, and these things that... As we think about, we're going to do a pilot, somebody comes to us, they have a great idea, we think it's a great idea, you know, we go off and we download some stuff, uh, we think about the impact, the visibility, do I need to automate it, uh, but what happens is, of course, the way you think about, and absolutely, and by the way, the way you should think about doing a proof of concept or pilot is very different. So, you know, the whole idea to fail fast, go innovate, uh, go prototype, uh, by the way, who here, I guess would say, who doesn't have a Raspberry Pi? Okay, if you don't, also go to Amazon.com and spend $64 and get the kit and do a little, do a little uh, scripting and plug some sensors in. It's the best way, uh, I think, to, uh, you know, get your hands on, uh, hand that. Okay. All right, so pilot to production, a bunch of decisions to make. Uh, and they're big ones, actually, and they're system-level things. And so this is, you know, one of the opportunities we have as an industry uh, to help influence and coach, uh, you know, whether it's developers or enterprises, again, or municipalities, whoever, uh, in, you know, you know, system architecture and system-level design considerations now. By the way, I think there's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the consultants in the room, I work with many of them and have over the years, you know, the consultants and the solution providers that can advise and uh, enterprises on how to just navigate these few things that are differences. It's a target-rich environment right now uh, if you're a consulting firm, I think. So what if you could have a path that said, I want to innovate, I want to do it cheaply, I want to do it quickly, I don't want to get locked into anything, uh, and I could take that development environment and I can maybe start with the Raspberry Pi, I can maybe use some open source stuff. And what if that, what if that same stuff naturally led to development tools and let you combine development tools that are standard, use development language, uh, for example, like Java, 
for which there are over 9 million developers active today. 9 million, you can go on any street corner almost and get a Java developer. That's a good thing, not proprietary, very open. Uh, you know, you've got a company like Oracle continuing to make massive investments in, uh, in uh, really in the whole Java, Java ecosystem. And what if that uh, path had a natural migration to a commercialized version of some frameworks and it, and it was able to run on uh, a set of hardware that was the basis for maybe what you would put into production. The same chipset, the same drivers, the same board support packages, whether it's a tiny, uh, a tiny almost invisible module or whether it's a, a large integrated uh, multifunction industrialized gateway, right? And what if that could be deployed on standard off-the-shelf hardware? Maybe not the cheapest, maybe not what you'll be working on in 12 months, but what if that uh, software and development and design ported naturally? And what if as you did that and you find out that it's actually working and hey, this is a pretty good idea and I wanna go operate this, kind of in my first level, my first threshold of capacity, that you could layer on uh, device tools, you could layer on security, and not as a bolt-on, but something that has naturally been designed from the beginning to, to, be, to be additive. And what if that stuff led to a production system that actually set you up for uh, uh, early deployments and then created the basis for you to uh, allow innovation of the ecosystem, whether it's on the gateways, uh, uh, you know, for you to embed it, make it smaller, make it cheaper, make it consume less power, make it become battery operated. Uh, so this is a path that exists, by the way. And so this is the path that when we talk about, and, you know, and our strategy is is this kind of progression. Okay, uh, this is not a sales pitch, but I just wanna show that you know, some of our, uh, the way we navigate this you know, through open source hardware, through embedded boards. By the way, this is what I love about our place in the market. I came to Eurotech uh, about a year ago from AT&T, wonderful company, good, my good friends are here. Uh, but the thing that I observed is you know, how, how difficult the hardware, where the electrical interfaces are happening to the sensors, uh, and how that intelligence uh, is really being applied. And really that was, uh, has been a gap, I think, um, you know, for our market to get to, get to bigger production numbers. Um, okay, but the way, the way, as I explained, sort of in this defined path, the way it, uh, it happens is the same, way, the same way we make software portability in any, uh, in any other uh, model, and, and that is through abstraction. So not over abstraction, but this is, but IoT is a, and the technology stack is absolutely a stack of layers from the apps to the cloud to the infrastructure to the connectivity to the gateway to the sensor, right? And if you'll do a little abstraction and the correct abstraction, uh, it's one of the enablers that lets you go from a pilot to actually supportable commercialized production. So the way we do that is, uh, we do leverage Java, but let me say this. So we commercialize some open source stuff. We contribute to it. We're a founder of a group. Uh, I would hope that everybody here is familiar with, you know, the Eclipse Foundation uh, and what Cura is and what OSGI is. OSGI is a, is a design framework that allows componentization, thank you, of, um, of Java applications. So, you know, why is that important? Because these multifunction, multi-service gateways are multi, not single, right? So the great thing is uh, when you think about, you know, intelligence, it's not one big monolithic app that you're going to drop down on a, on a microprocessor on some bare OS somewhere. To make it manageable and securable, right, you do need abstraction. So we achieve that by being a, uh, being a, a member of, the, of uh, the Cura Working Group of the Eclipse Foundation. There's now an, an Eclipse IoT-led uh, group, which is, I believe, uh, going to be really one of the largest influencers in, uh, in standardization and standards creation um, for the embedded part of IoT. Uh, and just a little more on that. It, it's where we get our abstraction, by the way. We, you know, we founded this with IBM and Sierra Wireless in 2012. Uh, now 23 members, uh, it's the fastest growing working group uh, Cura is in the Eclipse Foundation, uh, well over a million lines of source code. You can actually go download Cura for free. 
You can go download uh, Kura Java. You can buy a Raspberry Pi. You can, you know, simple instructions to get started. But you can literally take this framework for free. Not our product. We don't make a cent. It has nothing to do with us. And, uh, but as you go through the progression of that defined path, right, we provide uh, the commercialized version of that as well as, you know, many uh, peripheral functions. Okay, some success stories and examples. So, you know, am I talking about things that just seem like good ideas or are these things that have worked for us? Uh, so these are things that have worked for us. Uh, the, the, the wonderful thing I like about, you know, where we're at in the market is, you know, there's many of us that say this, and it's true, is, and it's pretty exciting to be here, is, you know, we were, uh, we were country before country was cool, but we were IoT before IoT was, was cool. And that is, you know, as an embedded electronics maker, we've been putting intelligent industrial modules, as I said, many hundreds of thousands over the last decade. And what's great is those customers come to us now and say, how can I put more intelligence in there? What, what computing, what I.O., what architecture do I need to basically instrument something you've already been servicing me uh, you know, with for many, many years? So an example, uh, vending machines. So we went through this, by the way, all of these and many others you know, of these little cases have followed this exact uh, migration path of, of a dev kit, the open source version, the commercialized version, and then in many of them, what we're getting to now is, is the next generation of hardware, where what maybe started off as kind of a clunky gateway, maybe a little more I.O. on there than I needed, maybe too little, maybe a little more horsepower than I needed, right? What's happening, and, you know, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, will happen is, is that, that electronics will disappear. And by the way, our phones would disappear if we didn't have such big fingers and bad eyes, right? We know that, right? So the same thing is going to happen here. Uh, uh, vending machine, right? The thing that, uh, you know, working with a great company, we're going to publish these. Uh, these will be public very soon. Uh, that we see this sort of European and in, uh, in Japan, the smart vending and the autonomous vending. You know, I'm sure you've been to big corporate campuses where you go into, you think you're going to go get lunch and there's not a person in there. But it's all vended and it's all display-based um, with nutrition information, interactivity. Uh, and actually, I think that's interesting. You know, we think of M2M as a machine to a machine. One little interesting trend is all of a sudden now there are humans on the end of the machine to machine now. And, you know, I think that, by the way, we are, we think about 50 billion endpoints. Uh, you know, we are, we're, we're each one of those. So if we count us, there's, you know, there's 300 million or so. Uh, so this vending, uh, you know, we're working in a couple of different vending markets, uh, including some recycling markets, some unattended uh, a kind of vending, uh, you know, that's been very productive. And uh, a couple of them are actually into their second and third generation uh, of evolution and growth. So, um, very, you know, we're very proud of those. Same thing with commercial build, building management. Smart city, smart building, you know, smart everything is one of the biggest ones, you know, that, that we're all after uh, and, and trying to serve and influence because of the business impact. It's truly, you know, the amount of energy uh, and money associated uh, with understanding people and dynamics of power and the grid and so on is is remarkable. We, we, uh, we operate an industrial gateway in, uh, in partnership with a company on rooftops, uh, very large commercial buildings, uh, a little bit of uh, direct um, intelligence back to uh, really a centralized decision making. And uh, really the next generation of this is a little peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, self-correcting, self-adjusting, you know, rooftop intelligence. But it's that example of where there's some data remain that is retained locally. Decisions are made locally, you know, on a rooftop, and you know some of this are in you know markets where uh, you know you, you might want the system to be able to operate like that. And then um, you know a, a market that's been a great market for us for many years. Really, it was the beginning about 20 years ago of the first market we entered is transportation. You know, and, and this Eurotech, you know, based on the name, started in uh, in Europe, but but. Uh, uh, we, we do a lot of transportation, especially in rail, bus, and fleets. And, you know, not just on, you know, telematics and on where, where is the vehicle and how fast is it going, but really we've been supplying really the, the, the head to the, uh, of, of the processor and some of the underlying software uh, to, to these systems. You know, for many years we, we, we supply a system now that is connected. Again, went through the same progression path of the dev kit up through commercialization, where, you know, one of the largest, uh, uh, you know, metros in the country, 
um, you know, uses our system as it pulls into the yard to, uh, to connect, offload data, decide what, what vehicle gets serviced where, uh, and it's changing that. What is that, two minutes? Okay, all right. So, um, you know, the net of this is, you know, this works for us. And, uh, you know, I, again, it's, this is a you know, very pragmatic sort of thought for, for me. And, again, we wake up and our customers just want to know, how do you help me go faster? How do you help me accelerate? And not just on innovation and, and doing a pilot, but how do you help me when I prove that that's going to generate some kind of financial return? How do I get there? All right. So uh, I think we talked about cool chain monitoring in the panel. We've got a few customers where we've got different versions of this cool chain uh, in the process of being deployed, we've sort of dumbed that down a little bit, and that's uh, being demonstrated on our booth. It's got a bunch of sensors. We'll show you how we manage that, uh, modify that, support that. So I hope you come see us uh, in booth 406, okay? So thank you. It's been my pleasure. I hope to uh, see you and, and talk to many of you, all right? Thanks, Sue.